Well, hey, welcome all you wiretappers out there back here in the studio of Gangland Wire. And I have a really unusual, different show for you. And I, I know you're going to like it. If you watch Mafia Spies that Thomas Meyer I interviewed a couple of weeks ago, wrote that book, and they created this docu-series about Johnny Roselli being involved with the CIA and trying to kill Castro. And it's a great docu-series. I just finished it myself, uh, I think, uh, this last weekend. Well, you got to watch it. Now, I have the actor, Nick Annunziata, who played Johnny Roselli. Welcome, Nick. Nice to be here, Gary. Thanks for having me. So, Nick. You know, yeah. let's talk about you playing Johnny Roselli. I, I just want to compliment you, first of all, and, and I don't usually do this, as these guys know. <laughs> is, Thank you. Uh, I'm like Italian parents, you know, you got to do a lot to impress me. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that the truth? You really captured without having, you, you had no lines and you have really captured the the dangerousness and the, and the coolness and the uh, kind of you know, suave and deboner, as we say, out in the country of Johnny Roselli. You really captured that and got it across the audiences. There's no doubt about it. So tell us about playing Johnny Roselli. Oh, Johnny Roselli. <laughs> I've heard his name throughout my life in, in stories. Uh, his his affiliation in, 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 in as far as the JFK assassination, you hear these things. Um, Albert Anastasia. You, everybody has heard of him, obviously, to listen yeah. to your show. Okay. A friend of mine is friends with his son, and he's still alive. He's in his 80s. I'm not going to mention names, but I told him I was playing Johnny Roselli in the Mafia Spy series. So he connected me with this individual. So I get on the phone. I said, he goes, hey, I hear you're playing Johnny Roselli in the show. I said, yeah, it's wonderful. Tomorrow I'm actually doing the scene where I, I get the call that uh, JFK was assassinated. And he laughed. I go, what's so funny? He goes, what do you laugh? What do you mean you get the call? You're the guy who shot him. I go, what do you mean I shot him? He goes, I was there. He ran right past me. I'm telling you. Johnny Roselli put a bullet in JFK's head. I was like, oh, my God. I'm hearing it from a guy who said he was actually there. What does he have to gain by lying to me? I'm watching another podcast this week. I run across this guy. Now, this is a guy has been all throughout the mob folklore, if you will, and conversations because he was part of the Godfather, Gianni Russo. He just did a podcast. I just came across it last week. And he's saying, hey, JFK, let me tell you right now, it was Johnny Roselli. Johnny Roselli's the one who put the bullet in, 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 in JFK's head. And I'm going, wow, a year apart, these two guys, I don't know if they even know one another. Do we even know who really did it? There's, you know, theory. You have all these quote unquote experts. Can we really trust these experts anymore? I mean, look at the climate of the world right now. Everybody's full of really? shit. Yeah. You know, you just basically had <laughs> yes. to say, all right, well, I personally see two trees there. You're <laughs> telling me there's five. Who do I believe? <laughs> really? Right. So you got to come up yeah. with your own assumption. I think there is some truth to that. My personal opinion. Only because of someone telling me this that had nothing to gain from it. And. The same age, the age, not the same age, but the age makes sense. Yeah. Um, and there was a little more detail he got into with me. And I was like, wow. So the next day I go on set and I say, I, say, I go to the director, Tom, I said, you're never going to believe who I was talking to <laughs> yesterday. And they told me Johnny Roselli killed Jim K. He was one of the shooters. There was, there was like 13 shooters or something. It was not just one guy. And I'm like, whoa. He's like, yeah, and we this kind guy, of I, I yeah. think you said he was about 80 years old. So he would have been about 25 to 30 at the time. So he would yeah. have been. So, and he was there. Yeah. I said this to Tom and Tom's like, yeah, we kind of heard things like that too, but we don't want to get too into the conspiracy aspect of it. I said, yeah. well, there's no actual hard proof who did, who did it still. I don't believe. Right. Yeah. I there's mean, not. there is it. So it's basically, I guess if you get enough people telling the same story, then that becomes <laughs> the truth. Right. Agreed upon set of facts. <laughs> they could be a lie, but if we all agree on it, that's history. <laughs> right? To play this guy who happens to be doing nefarious things to make a living and also be charming at the same time was uh, interesting. It's my wife who doesn't give out compliments. We finished watching the show this week. And she said to me after the last episode, she says, you know something? 
you are really likable. Your character, in spite of what he yeah. he does, he's likable. Almost, it's the same thing like James Gandolfini as Tony Soprano. In spite mm-hmm. of his menacing and violent ways to make a living, you like the guy. You're cheering him on because you find that he has a, there's almost like a just quality. Like he's doing it for the better good, even though he's a bad guy. <laughs> David Chase always reminded people, you know, with the violence, these are not good people <laughs> you know? yeah. but they're still likable i mean there's a lot of actors unfortunately who don't play these characters well and they play them very two-dimensional and they play like yeah. and i think i was lucky because of just who i am gen you know my general makeup i don't have to play certain elements of myself the physicality takes care of it and there are a lot of people who play into that a little too much and it looks a little farcical i to me i i think when you're playing a, a non-fictional character and you're playing with that world you it's it's not over the top unless it's supposed to be a, a comedy or an, a satire kind of thing mm-hmm. i these guys are very subtle they're family people first and foremost there's always a motive why they do things it's not like they're all sociopaths i mean there's definitely a, a tinge of that and <laughs> blended with narcissism of course but <laughs> yeah they're doing it to to provide for the family. That's the old the old way, right? The, they would immigrate here. They do what they had to do so they can give their children a better life. And I think those lines at times get a little crossed and people forget that. Um, and they, I remember being on The Sopranos. People would say, oh, that, that episode was kind of boring. Why? Why? Oh, no one got killed. I'm like, that's not what these guys do all day long. They don't just wake up and go, hey, who's on the, the hit list today? You know? And, it's not how it works. It's about providing and making money. But I found the most endearing with being on The Sopranos was the family aspect, the dynamic of the family. I found it more endearing because I felt like I was peer- peeking in on Sunday dinners at my, my nanny and pop-up's house, mm-hmm. you know, being around my family every every Sunday dinner, you know, two o'clock, you know, the house, you, it was standing room only in the dining room. But I always sat next to my grandfather. I'm named after really? my grandfather. I didn't even understand that world and I didn't even understand I was probably around it most of my life without any knowledge of it. It probably helped you quite a little bit in in seeing that people, and and we all have this quality, men especially have this quality of you want to protect your family, you want to protect the people around you, you want to provide for them. And and you go out at, at, at home and around your friends, you're one person. I used to be like this. You go over in the city and you're another person because you got to, earn a living and you got to do what yeah. needs to be done. And so you probably internalized a lot of that growing up, which you could then translate that without having to act like a tough guy. You just have it innately in you, I would bet. Yeah. It's well, I live in Los Angeles now. So growing up on the East coast and then moving to Los Angeles, there was a big shift. I almost felt like for the first, truthfully, for the first 10 years living in California, I felt like a fish out of water. I bet. I, I felt like I didn't have an identity because being in New York, no, the neighborhood I grew up in, people knew my family. They knew my grandfather. I mean, I made I made my communion. My, my actually, my parents got married in the church that my p- grandparents that that's their parish. Then I made my communion there. I got to tell you a funny story about that, my communion. So I was born in in Frankfurt, Germany. My my dad was drafted, and his brother was drafted during yeah. Vietnam. You can't take both siblings to a war zone. So my dad went to Germany and my uncle went to be. So I'm born in Frankfurt. I come to the States two years later when I was two. I come back to the United States. My parents get divorced. That's like an insomnia. That's not something you do in, in yeah. Italian, especially in the late no. 60s, 1969, no. 1970. You don't get divorced. That, that's like, no, no. But my mother, God bless her soul, 100 pounds soaking wet, five foot nothing. My father, 6'2", 240 pounds. My mother's the strongest person I think I've ever come across in my life. You want to talk about a primal instinct to protect somebody, meaning me. My mother never spoke bad about my father, but yet when I would have visits with my dad, he would throw under the bus all the time. And then my mother said, listen, what happened between me and your dad is between us. He's your father. Respect your father. I never knew anything, never knew how they met. And then I heard stories. I'm like, all I I can tell you is this. My mother's father was walking my mother down the aisle. I'm getting somewhere with this story. Don't worry. <laughs> and whispers in my mother's ear, you know, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. All right. So fast forward. 
seven years old, I make my communion. I am so nervous, Gary, because now I have my stepfather there who I considered my dad, who I can, you know, who he's the one who just passed away last year. My biological father, that whole family, and then some. They are usually only allowed to have like, you know, five to 10 people from each kid's family in the church, right? Yeah. This is my grandfather's parish, mind you. My grandfather's neighborhood. Half the freaking church was there for me. I had no idea. <laughs> so I am so nervous because that's like, oh my God, I'm put in a situation. I don't know who to show loyalties to. And this is at seven years old. I didn't even understand this dynamic. I'm on the altar. Priest is coming to take my catechism book. I fainted. On the altar, Gary. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> the next thing I, I know, I wake up. I'm outside. My dad's got smelly salts under my my nose. And I'm like, what, what the heck happened? I hear the story when I fainted. My dad, my stepdad, hops over the pew. Now, the priest has got the <laughs> microphone on, right? He's, he leans down. He's like, Jesus Christ, he's stiff as a board. The whole church is here. <laughs> so these are the stories I hear from the. But growing up, so like you said, picking up subtleties around these guys with no neck, you know, big yeah. freaking sausage fingers. I grew up around that my whole life. I didn't even understand what these people were. They, yeah. To me, they were just good people. Working on The Sopranos now. Yeah. You play. You played a, uh, was it The Underboss? Yeah, for Frankie and, Valley. And for, with Frankie Valley played, I uh, can't remember. Rusty Milio. Rusty Milio. And, and you were The Underboss. Uh, yeah. Rusty, it was Pri Eddie Prieto. And so how did you, I mean, you, you went to, you have a kind of a good story about getting that role. So why don't you start talking about that? Oh yeah. So <laughs> I was in New York recording an album. My hair was so long. It was like Jim Morrison from the doors in the sixties. <laughs> and I'm in the recording studio and my agent calls, I was in New York at the time. And he says, Hey, I got an audition for you for the Sopranos. I'm like, oh my God, that's wonderful. Great. You want to send me the material? He's like, Oh no, don't, don't get too crazy. It's just one line. I'm like, really? One line? All right, what is it? He goes, I thought Monks made it. They're talking about Grappa, right? I'm like, all right, I got it. They go, no, 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 there's more. I go, what do you mean there's more? They go, your name's Eddie Petro. You're an underboss. I'm like, wait a second. If it's just one line, why do I have all this backstory already, right? So I'm like, okay. So the next day I go in. I slick my hair back in a ponytail. I'm wearing like a shirt out of Goodfellas. And uh, there's these Guido kind of guys from like the Jersey Shore show sitting there, like with the ripped, the muscles and the T-shirts and all this stuff. I walk in and they're like, they thought I was like part of the show already. You know, like, who's this guy walking in? <laughs> so this producer comes out and she says, hey, guys, sorry, we were running late. Who's next? And these tough guys. Well, you go, you know, you. I said, what? Well, you figure it out. I'll go because I wanted to get back to the recording studio. And I go in. I go, hey, how you doing? Nick Anunziata, Eddie Picho. I thought Monks made it. What do you want me to act? It's a fucking throwaway line. And I walked out. I just left. A <laughs> couple hours later, I get a phone call from Major. I go, well, they want you at Silver Cup tomorrow. OK, great. Say, no, no, no. Hold on. You got four pages of dialogue now. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> so now they were very close to the vest that show they didn't want their storylines out you know people have an audition saying you know hey look i got an audition for sopranos so i go in i see all these guys that are getting you know for other parts there and i'm like i've seen these guys in mob movies like goodfellas and vinnie bella and try to think who else was there that i can i can't think of yeah vinnie bella was the one that just keeps coming to my head but this woman comes out and she's talking i hear her talking to one of the guys that was in the room with me the day before and I see her backside only. And, and all I hear is, what do you mean you don't know who Frankie Valli is? What's the matter with you? What kind of an Italian are you? And I'm going, Frankie Valli? What the hell does this have to do with anything? Yeah, I'm really? excited. <laughs> yeah, so now, so she comes, finally comes to me and she's like, yeah, you're, you're Frankie Valli's on the bus. I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, you, like I'm a little excited more for Frankie Valli than the Sopranos, right? <laughs> so I wind up going in, I do my thing. Frank's there. Everybody in the sh that's big on the show is in that room. I do my audition. They're like, hey, Nick, you know, so tell us. I go, yeah, call my agent. And I walked out. I just walked out. Just, <laughs> like, I'm like, I am not going to blow this. I want them wanting more. So I just left. Yeah, I go back to the recording studio. I get a phone call. I see, oh, agent, New York. All right, tell me something good. They go, all right, you booked it. And I was like, whoa, uh, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, wait, I lost. There you go. Yeah, I was good, like, whoa. Yeah. Frankie Valley, that had to be a dream come true for you. Oh, my singer. God. <laughs> It was like it was like checking off two things on my bucket list. It's like I got on the Sopranos and I'm meeting a legend of, of music 
that I grew up listening because my dad always had Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons on. You know, I love, you know, uh, Can't Take My Eyes Off of You. Every time I hear that song, I think of a scene from The Deer Hunter. I, it's just like, it was like, this is not real life, what's happening yeah. to me. It was so surreal. To this day, I mean, I respect when I meet actors that I really admire their work. I'm, I'm not what they call, I'm not a star fucker. I'm like, I'm like, oh, like a dumb, yeah. you know. Yeah. But I'm like, you know what? I treat them normal. Hey, I really dig your stuff. And I think because I have this ease about myself, um, and I'm not, I don't want anything from you. I just want to say, hey, I acknowledge your 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 work. And I just want to say thank you, you know. Some of them are very, very, very uh, sincere and grateful. I've met a couple where I wish I had never met. Uh, <laughs> and it's unfortunate because you're in a position where you should just be grateful where you are and without people saying they like your work, you wouldn't be there. Yeah. So tell us, so, tell us about that scene yeah. where you and Frankie Valley get killed by the Sicilian. Oh, they, wow. They imported so, in Johnny Sack has got Tony Soprano to import some Sicilians in or zips as they used to call them yeah, the to zips, kill you yeah. guys. <laughs> so yeah. that, that, that was a pretty dynamic scene. Uh, tell us about that. How did that go down? How did they do that? It looked real okay, to me. Okay, so it's funny. I, it, I, I've been... <laughs> most of the time, when I work, a lot of directors look that come up to me. When I first started hearing this, I thought it was a negative thing. They would say, hey, Nick, you're a one-take kind of guy, aren't you? And I thought, I took it as a, what do you think? I don't have range? You know, I, yeah. I looked at it. And they're like, <laughs> you nail it. And so yeah. we get to the set. We know it's our last episode, and this is how this is what I mean about how gracious and how wonderful everybody on that on that show was. A lot of people that weren't even filming, the late Frank Vincent, Tony Sharico, mm -hmm. they came to the set in Brooklyn to wish us well and thank you for being part of the show. I mean, how gracious is that to come on their day off to Brooklyn on a location to watch us finish our run on the show? But the funny thing was, we I get there and they have eleven pieces of car glass because they thought they were going to have to do this yeah. scene so many times. So in my head, I'm going, man, that's a waste of money. <laughs> They're not going to use all that glass. <laughs> so we do it, doing the scene, boom, one shot. I I'm a firearms instructor for a long time. I grew up around weapons my whole life. Um, a lot of people anticipate a shot, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of, I bet there, you know, I don't know what your background is. I mean, were you in law enforcement or yeah, a cop? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, a lot of people yeah. anticipate recoil, right? Oh yeah. That, that's, that's what throws you off at the range as you, you, you jerk a little bit just before it goes. So, yeah. Yeah. So I don't anticipate a shot. I never anticipate. So when you see my reaction, when you see the shot, it's, it was spot. One piece of glass. One take, Gary. One, <laughs> one take. take. <laughs> one take wonder. I tell you what. That's direct, it. I'm, nothing's so better I'm than one. one take. I know that. That's and it. and Frankie Valley pulled it off too pretty well. <laughs> oh my God. We had such fun. We used to sometimes like because we both lived in California. We both would fly in for the show because yeah. it was filmed on location in the East Coast. But there are times in New York where we'd have an early call and we'd meet for breakfast in the morning in the city at the hotel, yeah. like where he was staying at. And uh, then we'd get picked up by the crew van to take us on location, which was great. He was so generous. Still to this day, he actually called me like a month ago and said that Nick Vallelonga is rewriting Jersey Boys, the movie, no. to redo it. Um, he wanted he wanted the original, the one that Clint Eastwood directed. He he wasn't a, a huge fan of. He wanted it a different way. He wanted mm -hmm. the story told differently. And I guess, you know, the art is, you know, subjective. It's everyone, yeah. everyone has their an idea, but it's his life. So I can understand him wanting to do it his way. And so they're rewriting it. And he called me, says, Nick, I, I'm rewriting it with Nick, who won the Oscar for uh, Green Book, mm -hmm. the true story of uh, yeah, I saw that. Tony Vallelonga, who drove um, Dr. Shirley, the first, the black uh, musician through the, the, the South during right. the 60s. Mm -hmm. great movie but tony lip tony valalonga the irony of that is see the tie-ins he was actually on the sopranos mm. which was really interesting 
Um, but Frankie called me and said he wants me to be part of the show. If it, cool. if it, you know, yeah. So he's always thinking of me. He actually got me an audition after they won the Tony for Jersey Boys. Um, I mean, like literally the next day he called me up. I'm like congratulating, texting. I'm like, oh, that's so awesome, right? Because he said to me, he goes, you know what, Nick? You're Tommy DeVito. You are him. <laughs> and I didn't know how to take that because I really didn't know much about these guys other than the yeah. music. I didn't know their personal lives. And, but I guess Tommy is similar to Johnny Roselli, very, very outspoken guy, fun, charming, but a yeah. little dangerous. So I got the audition for that to, to, to do it on stage. I, got, I was offered the understudy. I turned it down, you know, respectfully. They said, why? I said, listen, you know where I come from? I said, if I tell someone I'm in Jersey Boys on Broadway and the guy who just won the Tony is not sick, I'm never going to get to perform. (laughs) Yeah. You understand the people I know? This guy is going (laughs) to fall down the stairs. I'm telling you. (laughs) That kind of element you can't learn in an acting class. I mean, I just... Just the subtleties, the funny stuff, I guess, is what makes it. I'm real. I, that's it. I just, yeah. I just, I internalize it. I don't think about method. I, I went to school. I had wonderful teachers, uh, but a very short time of school. I was already doing stage work, and I said, I need to know what I'm, what these people are talking about. I feel so out of my element. I wound up going to HB Studios in the Village, and I wound up my teacher. I auditioned for is was Ann Jackson. Eli Wallach's wife, another big Broadway person, had no idea who these people were. So I didn't get in my own way like, oh, my God, I'm with so-and-so. You know, I, that never entered my my system. And then I kept on hearing about this woman, Uta Hagen, Uta, Uta, Uta. I'm like, who's Uta Hagen? My fellow student classmates were like, you're in her school, stupid. I'm like, I, what do I know? I'm 25 years old, right? I have no idea. But I was raw, Gary. I was raw. Yeah. And I, I was real as can be. So I wasn't confined to rules. And that's how I am with music, too. I'm not confined to rules. I don't read music. I know how to play it. And I know what I want to. I hear it in my head. And mm-hmm. I sound it out. And I, my friend, Brian, who I write music with for the last 20 something years. He's like, I never thought of that. I said, yeah, because you guys are schooled. I don't know the rules. Let's just play it and see how it sounds. It's either, there's no right or wrong. It's either good or bad. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's how I. And that's how I view acting as well. There's no right or wrong. It's good yeah. and bad. When people ask me, what's my method? What's, what's your what, what style? I'm like, <laughs> I don't even think about that. You show I don't. Up. <laughs> I show up. And my imagination is so vivid. And I have a lot to pull from because I've lived my life. I've been around some really character type people in my life you know mm-hmm. so i have a lot to pull from and and people ask me they go what's your favorite kind of class i said you know what life i observe people i watch yeah. people you know so and that playing, helped me yeah play a johnny roselli now I, you you really like i said before i think you exuded this charm but yet dangerousness and and you said you you know a lot about guns so i thought when johnny roselli handled a gun i thought damn he does that pretty smooth where everybody you know, a lot of people you stick a gun in their hand, and they you can tell that they they get they get tense up just a little bit. You were pretty smooth with that. It, oh, when it, I when I was when I was at the uh, when I was holding the M ones and yeah, and yeah. It's even when I was on set, people they're like, "Oh my god, this!" It, because what what you you know this from handling firearms? All it is an extension of your hand, yeah. right? So if you make it an object, it's going to be an object, and it's going to look yeah. awkward. But I, I understand the functions of it. I know what it does. It's a tool. I don't look at it any other way than it's a tool. It's funny. After Mafia Spies, I, I just I did two other projects just recently. That coming one is coming out at the end of September. I I played a, a colonel in World War II. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's called Twenty Four Hours to D Day, and I star opposite Eric Roberts. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, I don't know. You guys probably know who he is, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Julia's um, brother. <laughs> yeah. Connection to G- you talk about making those connections, you get your connection to Julia there. <laughs> there you go. But I never, didn't bring any of that up. He was so fun to work with. Um, yeah. I mean, the guy's a legend. He's, yeah, he's, he's done uh, a lot of stuff. Oh, my. More than any other actor, I think. Yeah. He, um, but the funny thing on that show, on that movie, you're, I probably would have worked 
three to five days on that shoot. I had to do everything in one day. We had we did all his scenes in one day, and I'm in every scene with him. That was an experience I never had in my entire career. And I thought that wow, that was kind of interesting. You know, good thing you're a one and, take wonder. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> so they they knew they got their money's worth with me. It's like, all right, we gotta because I originally went in to, <laughs> to audition for another part. And yeah. then the casting, the casting person reached out to me and said, Listen, we want to offer you another role. And I said, I thought I was being downgraded. And I'm like, uh, okay, what is it? They go, No, no, you're gonna be opposite to a movie star. I said, well, who is it? I hope we can't tell you. I said, what do you mean you can't tell me? You're asking me if I want to do it. You're not going to tell me who it is? So they tell me. I'm like, I'm in. Sure. So, but they go, here's the catch. You're doing all your work in one day. So that, to me, at first, most people go, oh, that stinks. Because they're looking at the financial aspect of it. I looked at it as, wow, they trust me enough to know that I can actually do that all in one day. Yeah. So that, that made me feel good. And then I did an action movie right after that the same week. So I went from 1944 to 2024 <laughs> and I'm going back to gun stuff, you know, yeah. but, You're but Johnny was early. <laughs> I didn't prepare for that in the, in the, in the traditional sense. I didn't read the book. I did not want to have a fixed idea of how the author portrayed him in the book. I wanted to take what I had, the knowledge I had from knowing people in that world and bring that character to life, but still maintain, you know, his charm, his danger mm -hmm. without being unlikable. And at the end, like I said, my wife never gives a compliment. She says, you, you pulled it off. You were likable. Yeah. yeah, you did. You did. You really did. And, and it also came across, you were patriotic in a way, because that's what was interesting about that story is how patriotic Johnny Roselli became. Actually, they say that Sam uh, uh, Giancana went, called him <laughs> some kind of a name about being patriotic. And, and you yeah, really he's... pulled that off, too. Your friendliness with the, your CIA handlers and those. Uh, Cubans, oh, Bill Harvey. All, yeah. all without saying a word. I mean, you, I tell you, it was a heck of a story. Thanks. Yeah, that's what I tell people. I said, look, this was an exercise for me in a way. You you don't even need to have the volume on. You yeah. can watch those scenes and you know what's happening. Yeah, I agree. It's it's a harken back to, you know, Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, the silent era movies, right? And it's very and it's shot very cinematic, so it's yeah. wonderful. You know, I had a, I had a great pleasure last week. We were in New York doing press for it, and I got to meet Bill Boggs. You know, it, I grew up as a kid watching him. He was all over the television. When uh, Tom, the director, said, hey, we're going to go to this restaurant with me, you and Bill. Let's go. I'm like, oh, my God, really? He goes. And then I hear Bill in the background. Is that Johnny Roselli? Tell him he was <laughs> awesome. I was like, oh, my God, that's so great. I'm like, yeah, he loved your character. He's like, oh my, that's so nice to hear that. You know, and I'm genuinely like a little kid. It's like, wow, you like me? because <laughs> it is it's so much fun to do it and then to see people's response to it is fun and i guess sometimes i i you never want it to end but it, what does picasso say you know your job as an artist is to become great and give it away yeah so <laughs> if i'm fortunate way. enough to keep working and keep a roof over my head yeah that's 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 it, you know that's yeah. that's all I I, I want. I'm yeah, not a very uh, demanding guy. As you know, that entertainment business is a tough, tough business. I, it's I brutal. You, I, I, I'm just in it in a small way, and it's like, man, this is hard. This is tough. It's very hard. The good thing is, all the years that I, I've been in it now, I've I understand how to navigate it better. Oh yeah. In the beginning, you think, oh, you did the work. The phone's going to ring off the hook, right? <laughs> That's a bunch of nonsense. And and I like you can see I'm a straight up guy. Just tell you how yeah. it is. I don't know how to na I didn't I didn't at the time I didn't know how to navigate that and still keep my integrity. Because if I'm out with you and say you're a producer at the time, this is when I was in my early 30s. And I'm on a show at the time because I did two soaps as well. I was on two soaps. I was on Days of Our Lives for a combined the two years, right. two different characters. Yeah. And then I was on General Hospital for two years straight. I was on television, I'd be out and I'd be on TV at the same time, right? <laughs> and people would, and I would think that uh, some acknowledgement maybe, I don't know, like 
get me more work? It didn't. And I didn't understand you have to invest in yourself. You have to promote. So this, I, I all those years of doing all this, I figured it out that works for me where I don't feel like I'm compromising my, my integrity because I don't, I don't want to put myself in a situation where I offend, offend somebody by me just being myself. Yeah. But after a while you get over the fact that, Hey, look, this is, this is something I read recently and it really resonated with me. And it said, stop trying to be liked by everybody. You don't even like everybody. <laughs> so <laughs> how many, you know, and it really, really like, man, at my age, that I, I have to learn that lesson, but it really, it's those one liners. It's those things that the light bulb goes off where you finally get it. You understand yeah. it, but it doesn't internalize until when it's ready. Yeah. I so, understand. It yeah. worked for you to get in that Sopranos role. It seems to me like <laughs> you said, that's a What's throw that? right wine. I said it worked for you getting that Sopranos role, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't, so that character wasn't about the dialogue. It was about the essence of this guy because I'm in a room of characters who are legendary. So I can't get swallowed up on the screen yeah. if I can't, have if I don't have a presence, right? Yeah. So I have to be able to hold my own. I got some wonderful advice from uh, an actor who passed away. His name was uh, uh, Joe Santos. He was a character actor. He'd been in tons of movies and t- television. I think he was on um, the Hill Street Blues for a long time. One of those cop shows. Just a wonderful actor. But I, when I knew I was going to work with him, see, that's what I'm saying. I got so lucky to work with such people that I grew up watching. And I'm like, I'm sitting right next to the guy and he's talking to me like a regular guy. Yeah. So it was wonderful. I was very spoiled in that fact. I met a couple of movie stars. I will tell you that are huge now, huge that are so full of shit (laughs) and so self-serving. Yeah. And envious, even though they're where they're at, are threatened by people because, and meanwhile, these people have, I mean, they're worth over a hundred billion dollars. And yet you're yeah. still worried that you're not going to eat. <laughs> really? <laughs> I'm one of these guys, guy. Look, if I'm at that level, I send the elevator down. I'm a big <laughs> fan of success. I love to see people succeed. I genuinely am happy when I see people accomplish something. I'm, I'm really clapping for you. Mm-hmm. I really am. I just not, I do not have any jealousy. What I do have is, if I see you doing it and I know you and you're doing well, I'm very happy for you. But it also inspires me because I'm like, if you can do it, I can do it. This is how gracious people are on that show and how wonderful they were. And it was like a family from everybody, from the, from the craft services to James Gandolfini and everybody in the middle. People were very, it was a family, looked out for one another. And I remember guys like fr- the late Frank Vincent, Tony Sharico, these guys came to the set on our last episode wish us well and thank you for being part of the show and taking pictures all that nonsense we found out we knew that was going to be our last scene on the show they call it they're wrapping our characters we're done right we shot that in brooklyn and i'll never forget so we get to the set and they have like 11 pieces of glass for the for the car window where the bullet goes and hits me first and i'm thinking to myself what a waste of money (laughs) they're not going to use all those pieces of glass we did it in one take like I said earlier, in regards to, you know, I don't anticipate the shot. And we got it in one shot. It was wonderful. One one shot. Yeah. I watched that. I have to think about, like, you had, didn't anticipate the shot. But you know, you and Frankie Valley both know that all of a sudden uh, the, the shit's going to hit the fan, if you will. The glass is going to be crashing and, and uh, there's going to be sounds going off and guns are going to appear, which... I don't know. You guys did a heck of a job. I, I can't even Thanks. imagine what that would have been like. Yeah. Well, that glass actually did. I mean, there was a charge on it, like a like to pop the glass. Yeah. Right. So it, it was behind me. So nothing went towards my face, which was great. And it's sugar glass. Yeah. So it doesn't cut you. But I'm sure, I mean, if it hits you in the eye, it's not a good feeling. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> we were able to do it without any injury. One take. <laughs> you know, maybe I should have done it a few times. I got some overtime. I don't know. <laughs> really, yeah. You and Frankie, you and Frankie Valley had kind of a bonding experience. You used to, you talked about seeing him out in Las Vegas after that and having coffee yep. with him and everything. You guys are buds now, aren't you? 
Yeah, we look pretty good for two dead guys, right? You know. We are- <laughs> <laughs> now I have to say, you said you had breakfast with him many times before you went to the set. Now, yeah. did you maintain your boss and underboss characters? <laughs> did you stay in you know, character off set? You know, actually, we did. We would talk. You know, believe it or not, we would talk music. Yeah, and he would tell me stories, and he would tell me even stories about the four seasons and, and when they were coming up, I'm not, I'm not Jewish, but he's a mensch, you know, he's a good guy, you know, (laughs) he's a real paisan. He's a, you know, (laughs) and, and he lives, he lives literally like 10 minutes from me. Like we live, we live, we live relatively close. When I was in New York last week, when I was in East Hampton doing the, the mafia spies press thing, uh, he was in Westbury doing the show. It would have been so good to see each other. Again, on the East Coast, I would have loved that. <laughs> but he's so generous. He's such a good guy. He, right. I, I love I, I mean, I'm, I, I I have a story right now I'm trying to get finished. We're doing a, a pilot, a comedy pilot, a mafia pilot. I said to him, I said, Frank, I want you to play this role. He's like, I'm in. I'm like, do you want to read it first? He goes, Nick, I'm in. If you're doing it, I'm in. I'm in. I'm like, cool. how giving is that, right? And, That's good, and, yeah. Right? And the trust knowing that I'm not going to make him look foolish yeah and so i wrote something so spectacular and funny and i think the audience hopefully we get to do it and the world gets to see it and then one day you and i'll be talking about hey remember when i told you that (laughs) yeah yeah we'll be we'll we'll, you get that out we'll have to do a show to promote that and we'll talk about absolutely that's great okay one last one last story yes what was it like everybody will want to know what it's like to work with James Gandolfini is, is he as good a guy as everybody wow. is he's, you know, he's got the rest of his soul. He's dead now, but I, I, everything I've ever read that he's, he's just a prince of a fellow to work with. Was it like that? All right. I have, I, I, I'll give you a couple of quick ones. Um, meeting him on the set, him and David Chase came up to me, like I said, and they introduced themselves after the first table read totally made everything feel like an equal playing field. Very gracious. Jimmy said to me, he goes, listen, where do you live? I said, I live in Los Angeles. He goes, well, when I'm out there doing movies, you should come to the set. Just ask for me. I never took him up on that. I'm not one of those guys. You know, I don't bug people. I don't, yeah. I, I just, you know, you're there to do a job. I appreciate you inviting me into that. And maybe I should have taken him up on that. So we didn't talk for a while. Episode one of season six, the last episode, last season of the show. I'm in that first episode, me, Frankie, we go to a funeral and we talk to James about the guy that's in the coffin, right? And I and we're talking about how they're, everybody's a rat. And I say to Jimmy, yeah, W-R-A-T. Like, they're all got a radio show. You know, we're all doing stuff like that. <laughs> so that day, so that, that season was only negotiated for like, I think, 10 episodes. That's it, right? Now, we're shooting in Belleville, New Jersey. The streets are blocked off. There's people. I mean, this was like you're like you're at the Super Bowl. I mean, that's how many people are like watching, see they can see somebody. And we're wondering, why is this day taking so long? What's going on? What's going on? The first day on the set, HBO decided that they wanted more episodes than 10. And James said, listen, I negotiated 10 episodes. That's it. That's all I'm doing. I made more money that one day of work mm-hmm. than I did in all the episodes together, pretty much. I mean, I got the check that day. I was like, I was afraid to catch it. I was like, uh, did they make a mistake here? <laughs> Are they going to ask for this back? Because Jane, while they were negotiating, this is the kind of guy Jimmy was. He was a fair guy. He he, and I relate to that. I he, he's an underdog kind of guy. It's like, listen, he paid for people when they were out of work. He gave them salaries. He gave them money out of his own pocket. He that day. Because of him negotiating and not, we turned into overtime, double golden time, triple golden time, penalty, penalty, penalty. So I literally, I made, I mean, I made five figures that day on that one day on the episode, on that episode. <laughs> it was crazy. Fast. So now I move, I'm in LA, he's living in New York and we're talking about things. And he's like, you know, what are you doing out here? I said, listen, I got to make a living. Why, you know, that's why I'm not. He's, so he, he started talking to me. He was putting together a television show about police officers and first responders, and he wanted me to be part. And I was very grateful for that because he was very um, into 
veterans, police, firemen. He, he was very giving in that world. He was a good guy. So five days before he passed away was the last communication he and I had. Because I had picked something up for him. And he said, yeah, I'm going to Italy with my son. I'll be back. And then, yeah, I'll see you then. I'm like, great. And I was, then all of a sudden, like two days later, I knew exactly where I was. I was in a store and a friend goes, Nick, come here. I was like, oh, my God, are you kidding me? And he passed away. It's like, wow, what a loss. Good yeah. guy. Just yeah, a good bad. guy. Yeah. Yeah. If he liked you, he liked you. He's one of those yeah. guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's Nick so, Anunziata, it was so generous of you to come on my show here. I really enjoyed uh, talking to you. Thanks, Gary. I felt, you know I felt like we were just, the only thing missing was a couple of sandwiches, you know, having, a, we're having lunch. <laughs> really? <yeah. laughs> really? All right, guys, don't forget, I like to ride motorcycles, so watch out for motorcycles when you're on the streets out there. And if you have a problem with PTSD and you've been in the service, go to the VA website and get that hotline number. If you have a problem with drugs or alcohol, which goes along with PTSD many times, go see Anthony Ruggiano, you know, former Gambino guy. He's a drug and alcohol counselor down in Florida, and he has a hotline on his website and on his YouTube channel. So don't forget, like and subscribe. Watch Mafia Spies with Nick Annunziati. He plays Johnny Roselli in a, just an, an excellent, excellent docuseries. So thanks a lot, guys. Thank and thank you, Nick. All right, Gary. Thank you so much. Gary, 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 thank you so much.